lot of big games came out in 2018, and it was really tough to find time to beat them all. One of those games that I never finished was Red Dead Redemption 2. I had been following Rockstar through the years, but mostly on the Grand Theft Auto side. When it came to Red Dead Revolver and Red Dead Redemption, I only really scratched the surface. Its sequel, though, I wasn't going to miss, as it was heavily hyped leading up to its release. Proclaimed as Rockstar's next masterpiece, I was really excited to see what all the fuss was about. Despite my anticipation, I never finished Red Dead Redemption 2. I had put down the game a long time ago for reasons unknown to me looking back. Fast forward to January of 2020 and I decided to go back and play the game from scratch. 70 hours later, I finally finished Red Dead Redemption 2. Red Dead Redemption 2 attempts to present one of the most realistic open world experiences ever seen in a game, realism being the key word. Right off the bat, Red Dead 2 is one of the best looking games I've ever seen. It's not the most technically advanced game of all time, but as a total composition, it is incredibly beautiful. First of all, the general look of the game is lovely. It's a striking game, realistically portrayed, filled with the undeniable beauty of the American Southwest. When you leave the snowy mountains of the game's introduction behind, you'll get to see everything you expect and then some. Expansive valleys, big lakes, raging rivers, steamy swamps, open grasslands, small towns, big towns, big cities, trains, and a variety of wildlife, and so much more. And this is only the stuff in the background. Up close, the character models shine with detailed hair, while punchy gun sounds provide a destructive symphony to the brutal gunfights. And the voice acting is to the highest pedigree. There's also an amazing and wonderful day-night cycle and dynamic weather system, which creates wind and rain and snow and mist and fog and rainbows, adding to the sim-like nature of the title. In the morning and during dusk, the world looks especially vibrant. Sometimes the game does change weather on the fly to suit story moments during transitions or load screens, which does feel weird, but overall the weather and the effects are pristinely done. A beautifully framed forest path with trees and plants dancing softly in the wind. A serene lake that looks like it could be captured in a picture. Sun rays splashing through canopy, moisture collecting in the air, and puddles that form realistically over ground. It just looks so damn good. Obviously eye candy is great for the player, but really the goal of it here is to complement the setting and tone of the story. Red Dead 2 is a frontier story that depicts the evolution of early industrial expansion, and its theme is the human struggle to attain order. As bandits and self-governed people transition into a society with laws, there's this constant battle to leave the old ways behind. Some, like Dutch and most of his gang, they simply don't want to accept that fact. They pillage, they steal, they kill, they take whatever they want when they want to. There are people on the run, constantly moving in fear of the new world catching up to them and throwing them behind bars for their crimes. In its purest form, Red Dead 2 is a game that depicts the war of old versus new, and the world conveys this theme perfectly as new environments are introduced to meet the thematic demands of each new story beat. You've got Valentine and Strawberry, two piece of crap towns on the western side of the map that have run down buildings, muddy roads, and simple poor folk as the populace. Then you've got Saint Denis with its fancy buildings and factories and train cars and industrial smokestacks as the counterpoint when the story picks up and the gang gets richer. You can really feel the disparity between these places. Not only do you get it from the city itself, but you see it with the people in the activity. More commerce, more fancy shops, more educated people, the strings that get pulled into motion as the world is changing. This idea of progressing civilization isn't just mirrored in the game's theme or aesthetics, but also with each new camp the gang builds throughout the game. At first, it's shitty outdoor rags and shelters. Then it's a mildly cozy nuke in the swamp. Then you get an actual house with rooms and furniture. You can feel the ebb and flow and the tug of the game, moving slowly to match the rhythm of the story within its world building. The most iconic moment this is felt occurs in Epilogue 2 when John moves to Breacher's Hope during his major character arc conclusion. Instead of green fields and tall mountains and trees and beautiful meadows, Blackwater is a shithole and its surroundings are essentially dried up, unpleasant, and rocky, which visually links John's journey of leaving his old life behind to the actual game world. Such subtle thoughtfulness is crammed everywhere into this game. Secondly, Red Dead Redemption 2 isn't just beautiful, it's incredibly detailed. Incredibly, painfully detailed. 
From trails that cut into the snow, crackling fires that offer realistic illumination, to water that looks too good to be true, it's hard not to appreciate the technical craftsmanship. I might go so far to say that this small scene here has some of the most beautiful waves I've ever seen in a game. You can see the waves crash into the surf, bubbling and foaming at the edge just the way those waves should. You see the rocks underneath the water in a different hue of bluish green, just the way they should be. It takes your breath away. When you go into buildings, you can search every drawer individually. Everything you pick up, Arthur reaches for specifically, whether it be a can of food and a cabinet, loot from a fallen enemy, or a gun you have stored on a horse. You can shoot off people's hats. If you pause when you cross water, you can drift downstream. When you go down a slope, you slide. Wood splinters fire up from boxes torn asunder, and if you skin a rabbit, you rip it off and see every piece of flesh and blood left on the corpse. It is astounding the lengths Rockstar went to to make this game gush with detail. This detail isn't just here to sell copies or please the visual palette, it's here to bring immersion. Immersion is a tricky thing for a game to tackle because immersion is not built into a game code, it's felt. Patrons around camp address you based off the time of day and the way you look. If it's time to eat, they'll call out the dinner bell to you. Hair grows back naturally over time, not just on Arthur, but Dutch and the crew too. Mud splashes on your trousers, weather affects your well-being. The game benefits artistically by building all of this detail up, but it does have a cost to it. It should be no surprise when I say Red Dead 2 is one of the most slow-paced games ever to be created. First and foremost, the introduction to the game is essentially a multi-hour follow-me escort mission while the gang waits out a snowstorm. This includes what we call bitch work, following people on horseback, walking around camp, and listening to story bits. Most of it has practical servicing, such as providing backstory and teaching basic controls to the player, but there's really no gameplay to speak of. So you could say that this is essentially the game's tutorial. It takes a long time a very long time for Red Dead 2 to open up to you, hours in fact, and while I'm not surprised to see such long-windedness in this title, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't too much. Especially when you compare it to the first 30 minutes of Grand Theft Auto V, which literally explodes onto the scene and puts the player into immediate action. One of the jobs the game has is to strike a good balance between getting going and laying out the groundwork of so the story, the backstory, the plot, and the controls. The ramp up phase in Red Dead 2 is one of the longest I've ever experienced because what they're really doing is just setting up immersion. Red Dead 2 is an incredibly methodical slow game driven by a pestilent desire to immerse players in every single action on screen at all times. You cannot escape it. This game wants you to be immersed. Not in the introduction, not in the finale, the entire game is one exercise and video game immersion. This is achieved by having players participate in most things that other games either remove, allow players to skip, or just speed up. Things like manually looting enemies, having to sit through intricate crafting, cooking and weapon management protocol, not having access to your horse if it's too far away, limited fast travel, and above all else, when a game kind of does this weird thing where it starts to influence player control based off where you're at. Red Dead 2 loves to force you into the pace it wants and control where you need to be. For example, getting in proximity of an objective will often cause the game to force you to stop riding your horse, decelerate, or if you're on foot, slow your run speed to a walk. If you turn in a direction you shouldn't, the controller will sometimes force you back on the pre-drawn path if you're on a quest. If you get too close to an NPC that wants to talk to you, your character does this spinny thing and you turn around automatically until you interject. And my least favorite one is when you ride out to a mission, the game just loves to force you into these slow trots so that they can have conversations to, again, immerse you. I appreciate the amount of conversations thrown around during these horse riding moments as they can provide a nice backstory to the game, fill you in on quests, but God damn, can they be annoying to be forced to sit through if you're just not interested? When so much of the game revolves around riding from point A to B, at some point, you just kind of get fed up with not being able to ride at your own speed, especially when the chit chat is just not related to the story, and there is quite a bit of that. They could have either chopped the conversation in half, allowing you to ride at will and still give you that conversation, 
which would speed up the process of traveling tremendously, or just chop out all the talking that isn't really crucial to the story, which there is, again, a lot of it. Thankfully, though, towards the end of the game, things get more personal, things start to heat up and get more interesting, which makes the forced writing sessions feel somewhat less of a chore. Missions are also often restrictive in the steps needed to progress through them, which is one of the more frustrating aspects to Red Dead 2. In this title, you need to check off each step the game wants you to make in the specific order, or else you just you can't play the game. You can think of it as being in a bubble, and if you try to leave that bubble, the bubble will burst, leading to a restart checkpoint screen. In this example here, I'm sneaking up to kill the guards of this camp. I know I have to do this because I failed the mission, and this is my second try. So I sneak up, and I get ready to attack them, but the game doesn't let me because I forgot to stand next to Charles, so he could activate the next step of the mission. I tried walking outside the bubble, and the game did not appreciate that. If you ever get too far ahead of the bubble, or too far behind the bubble, the game will literally freeze, and nothing can happen. It's bizarre. Red Dead 2 wants you to experience the game's beats to keep you immersed in a specific way at all times, and there's no way around it. For as much freedom as Red Dead's open world gives you, it's surprising. The individual missions don't have that same flexibility. As for traveling around the world, it would have been nice to have the option to have horses run automatically. I mean, let's just be honest. In order to run at full speed in this game, you have to tap the A button, timing it with a horse's stride. Uh, what? If I had to guess, again, it's an effort to build immersion by trying to connect the horse's motor skills to your own, I guess. You can sort of get around this by entering cinematic mode, but you still have to hold down the button for the entire ride. Ah, I mean, jeez. Convenience. Convenience, convenience. There is no convenience in Red Dead 2. These concepts are novel in their attempt to build player engagement, but they're pretty inconvenient. You could say that for a lot of the elements that were made hyper-realistic for the sake of this immersion. The slow and clunky animation for looting enemies, which after a while I just stopped doing. The painful process of preparing animal skins, storing food, cooking food, eating food, cleaning weapons, sleeping, following companions on quests at a snail's pace, doing chores, etc. All of these elements do provide that immersion that Rockstar is maniacally striving for here, which does help build the game's character, but there is something to be said for the lack of convenience to the actual player. Because in the end, they start to wear you down and some of them become simply irrelevant. For example, chores, core upkeep, cleaning weapons, and even looting enemies. I mean, I just, I stopped doing all of these things after like 10 hours. That's because you don't really need to do any of this stuff once you get your upgrades and get a nice stock of tonics and potions and food and ammunition and get, you know, a lot of money inside your wallet. In the end, they become novelty practices at best, not at all necessary and not engaging either, especially when the controls are so stiff. If there was one thing to constantly complain about, it's the controls. While Rockstar games do feel very lifelike and deliberate, and very substantial in motion, they're also incredibly cumbersome. On horseback, on open ground, it's not so bad, but anywhere else, especially indoors, walking upstairs, trying to get through town, turning corners, stopping where you want to stop, talking to NPCs anywhere but from the front, running through uneven terrain, it can be quite aggravating. Combined with the bad gamepad setup controls, horrible menu design, and the fact that the game withholds a shocking amount of basic information from the player, the learning curve for this game is not only far longer than it should be, but the game controls also just never feel right at any point. Furthermore, in again another effort to promote realism and immersion, players also have little options to subvert traveling over long distances, especially at the end of missions, where the game just decides to dump you off in the middle of nowhere. I really appreciate when the game world would allow me to fast travel back to camp, but that only happened a handful of times, the first time being the bear hunting trip up north with Hosea. But mission after mission went on, ending with miles and miles of land between me and the next quest marker, and no way back outside of horse riding. I get the fact that fast travel doesn't make sense here, and I actually don't like it in general, but because the game allows fast travel when you upgrade your camp anyway, it feels like a shoe-in that you should at least have the option to do so at the end of every mission. Not the least of which because the game already requires you to travel extreme distances to objectives every single time you ride out. Red Dead 2 might be better off designing all of its traveling back to camp in the way the prison escape mission ends in Chapter 5. 
In this mission, you essentially finish it by shooting your way out of the prison, and then the game has you ride out with Sadie and John back to camp. As usual, you have to listen to some conversation, but it's 100% plot related, recounting what happened not only since he was captured, but also important information on how Dutch's somewhat suspicious transformation has been taking root. After that talk ends, the game takes you back to camp with a few quick cutscenes so you don't have to ride all the way back manually. This half fast travel approach gives the player that immersion the game is desperately trying to provide, but also doesn't make it onerous. It's easy to get lost in Red Dead 2's detail as the game is so beautiful and it's shocking that the world never seems to feel empty amidst the sprawling gargantuan map. The entire world is astounding and absolutely enchanting and the mechanisms put in place I just went over do promote realism for the player to connect to, which is what they were going for. But I think the game would have been better from a playability perspective if they just made things a little bit less of a hassle. I can understand striving to simulate hyper-realism to get players really drawn into the world, and the methodical pacing is thematically appropriate indeed. But does it border on the edge of insanity? Yes. If you were to ask anyone what the most important element to this game is, most would say the story and the open world gameplay. And for the most part it delivers, though it's not perfect. Red Dead 2 is broken up into six chapters as Arthur and his company are on the run with the desire to be everlasting bandits in a society evolving away from it, and it makes for a great backdrop to the game. Each chapter is broken down into a list of quests that appear as yellow dots on the map, and most of them are pretty good. You've got your assortment of character connection quests, fishing trips to connect to young ones, hunting trips for companion, relationship growth, etc. Then there's the main missions involving usually Dutch and your friends, the outlaws, and of course the endless quest to get more money. Money is the driving force for most of the game as the gang finds themselves continually broke and on the run from the Pinkertons. They have to make money to get away from the violence, but they can't make money without being violent. It is the vicious, violent cycle of Red Dead Redemption 2 that you cannot get away from. As such, at every milestone, lawmen show up to deter the gang's heists, someone dies, stakes begin to ramp up tremendously. This pushes chapter content along and allows the game to open up its map slowly over time as you get chased out from camp to camp, running from your troubles that you've caused, hoping that the next place you go to will have the answers you're looking for. Dutch continues to insist at every opportunity that the next heist or bank robbery will be the last, but of course it never is. This pushes them out of Valentine into a small conflict in Strawberry, then Clements Point, St. Denis, Cuba, Beaver Hollow, etc. Packing up and relocating constantly after each chapter reinforces the idea of a group that's just on the run and allows the game to remain fresh as it introduces new people, cities, and environments during the process. Of all the themes running through the game, of all the people you meet, the travesty that befalls you, and the loved ones that perish, it's really a story about Dutch and Arthur. At the center is a man possessed by the idea that somehow bandits can coexist in a society that wants to leave them behind. It's frontierism versus industrialism, and the frontier doesn't win. It can't. Time just has a way of changing. Dutch can't accept it, and he begins to change too. He's not who he seems. His motives aren't what he says they are. Arthur begins to catch on, and the tension grows. Interestingly enough, the game ditches the frontier for a while about three-fourths of the way through the game and dumps the player off on an island called Gorma. This area is the game's break in the clouds, freeing the player from the constant state of horseback riding on the frontier. This is one of the more odd areas of the game for the sole reason that it's essentially linear and over in just a few hours. After going through the trouble of rendering this beautiful island, you think that Rockstar would want to capitalize more on their work, but it's over really fast. I'm not sure if this area was rushed during development, but it feels rather convenient that the crew was rescued from servitude mere minutes upon arrival by a dude who just so happens to also be your ticket off the island. So you head back to camp, help the locals end the sugar plantation tyranny, and you get a boat back to the US, which is also very convenient. Overall, I really liked Cuba. In fact, I thought it was a really nice break from the main game, but the lead up was too happenstance and the conflict resolution was way too immediate for this chapter to feel anything more than an afterthought. Other chapters though are done a lot better. I really like chapter 3 the most, where Dutch and his gang want to rob both the Greys and the Braithwaites at the same time. Obviously things don't go to plan, John's son gets kidnapped and it's up to you to rescue him and destroy both families. 
So you slaughter them all, only to learn that Jack has been sold to Angelo Bronte. The interplay between these two families was really well done, and the scene where Granny Braithwaite dies in the burning fires of her own estate was really quite poetic. Chapter 4 was also done really well, showcasing the clash between outlaws and industry in Saint Denis as you attempt to rescue Jack from Angelo Bronte. It's here in the lavish mansions and frou-frou parties that you see the change in society before your eyes. People's mannerisms, their clothes, their attitudes, they all shift, and you feel increasingly out of place as a bandit and stupid in a suit and tie, playing nice and bowing to those with power and money. Bronte is no friend though, even though he may seem so, and he double crosses the player, forcing Dutch to kidnap him, and then he feeds him to an alligator, which is cool. Afterwards, again needing money, the constant drive of the game, Dutch sets up a bank robbery in the city. Things also don't go to plan, Lenny gets killed and the rest of the gang escape on a boat to where they eventually land in Cuba for chapter 5. While going through these chapters, the player will experience many shootouts as the main gameplay loop. Overall, I think the gunplay in Red Dead 2 is one of the strongest aspects of the game. Mechanically, the pistols and rifles and shotguns you have at your disposal feel so good, extremely powerful, and they're very fun to shoot, especially in slow motion with Deadeye. You'll get to rely on cover for the most part and chugging tonics to refill your gauges and health when you need to. The action feels intense, frantic, and enemies come at you from all sides which creates these very satisfying moments of gunslinging chaos. Much of the time you'll be fighting on foot, but the game does have a healthy dose of horseback shootouts, especially when fleeing from areas after finishing missions. It's here that the music kicks in as Pinkertons and Lawmans crash in on you from all sides, so of course you have to blast them, and it's really fun on horse because the game lets you kind of spin around while keeping your horse running at the same time so you can kill enemies while you're moving. It's pretty fun. God forbid you hit a boulder, though. One, but not the other. Everyone's got to choose what they're loyal to. Themselves. Unfortunately, most missions are confined to specific areas, and if you leave those imaginary boundaries, you'll get a game over screen. This results in a feeling of follow the yellow brick road style gameplay as the scripted nature of the action requires you to follow the game exactly where it wants you to be. In turn, this can make the missions feel a lot less sandboxy than the game itself as you have to play by the rules of the game with little leeway for player expression. As stated previously, Red Dead 2 really likes to keep the pace scripted and controlled. If you veer off a path you need to be on, the game will literally push you back on the trail. If you leave an area before completing an objective or do something the game doesn't want you to do, You'll sometimes insta-die and you'll have to restart at your last checkpoint. This extends to content in between checkpoints as well, such as game over screens if you don't kill enemies fast enough, or if you get too far from a person you're supposed to be following. This style of cornered off gameplay has always been a staple with Rockstar games, but it's taken to an extreme in Red Dead 2. For example, missions in GTA 5 require specific actions in specific spaces, but it doesn't feel as restrictive than it does here. Perhaps the slower pace of the game and the interactive slipperiness make it feel this way? Maybe it's because there's just more to see in GTA? All the same though, I wish the game wasn't as restrictive during missions, especially when the game is this gigantic. When I got into the groove of things, I ended up enjoying Red Dead 2's open world a lot more than the actual missions because of this. There's surprisingly low variety to the gameplay missions in Red Dead 2. Mostly it follows a very predictable pattern. Accept quest, watch cutscene, ride out with a partner, get to the checkpoint, do whatever needs to be done, and kill a bunch of bad guys as you escape. Thankfully, the core gunplay in Red Dead 2 is very solid and it never gets old. In fact, it's supremely satisfying in just about every way. But in terms of the actual gameplay diversity, there's not much here, besides shooting, horse riding, and following instructions and hitting buttons on the controller. Other gameplay elements are far more freedom-based though, such as robbing trains, going out into the open world and fucking around, hunting, playing poker and blackjack, fishing and getting involved in organic open world events, like helping people on the road or saving someone who's been kidnapped. Doing these small activities offers varying forms of enjoyment depending on your tolerance to padding and side content. Hunting is really what stands out, you know, hunting for legendary items is something I'd recommend actually, as you not only have to find them, but you have to track them and then use the right weapons and ammo to kill them in creative ways and then skin them and then you get a, you know, a little reward from the fence or whatever. It's a pretty rewarding process to go through, and you can kind of just do it whenever you want, however you want to. 
Other activities don't really hit the mark though, especially if you're hoping for the game to make good on its promise for extreme realism. For example, robbing people on trains or killing people out in the open world almost always results in a witness spotting you. Even if you're completely in the middle of nowhere, suddenly some guy will magically appear out of thin air and shout, I saw you shoot that man, I'm going to the police. Not only is this completely phoned in and quite artificial, especially for a game that wants to be what Red Dead 2 wants to be. It's also just kind of dumb. I mean, when would you ever announce to a murderer that you're going to the police to report him? I mean, do you want to die? Arthur is without question one of the best characters ever written by Rockstar Games. In Red Dead 2's 50 plus hour campaign, Arthur goes through a total transformation inside and out as he becomes increasingly suspicious that his longtime buddy and partner has gone down a road that he cannot go. As John says, Arthur's not a good man, but at least he's true to himself. He's a violent killing machine, but he usually wants to do the right thing. When Dutch starts killing for the funsies, even when they have another out for something better, Arthur continues to question him and ask the hard questions. Questions like, what's right and wrong? Is this necessary? And the big question, is there more to life than just killing? The buildup to and during chapter six with Dutch and Arthur is brilliant. Arthur and Dutch are at odds with each other at this point, with Arthur wanting Dutch to end the killing and the suffering. But the death toll continues to rise. Every interaction is like watching someone walk on thin ice that's about to crack, which ultimately leads to an unnerving feeling that this is going to end very badly. Arthur confronts Dutch, Dutch talks him down. Dutch keeps killing, Arthur keeps pushing. Arthur begins to disobey, Dutch turns away. With Micah snickering in his ear like worm tongue, Dutch's intentions become visible soon enough and Arthur can no longer stand for it. Dissension befalls the group as Dutch betrays John, Arthur, and refuses to rescue Abigail when she's taken. Dutch has completely transformed from good intention leader to conniving, twisted, soulless thief. In the end, after all the killing, it becomes Sadie, John, and Charles and Arthur versus Dutch, Micah, and his rats. It all seems lost when Arthur gets sick, knowing that his time is nearing an end. So the only thing he has left to do is help settle the score with Dutch, which is where we know Arthur will also die. On my playthrough, Arthur died on the mountain when Micah shot him in the face. It's sad to see Arthur never get the resolution or vindication that he was seeking, especially after Dutch left him to die. Even with high honor, Arthur still dies on the mountain without ever getting to see what will befall the two men that turned on him. I loved Arthur because his character arc was one of the best written in a game. He truly feels like a human. His performance is superb, and his personality is relatable, and his transformation is understandable. He's honestly not the bad guy he tries to make himself out to be. He starts out the game loyal to a fault, never questioning anything even relishing in the thrill of outlaw life. But as people start to get hurt and die and he learns about his fate, he changes. It's not just external circumstances caving in on him like other video game characters, which often creates a transformation artificially. It's really about an internal struggle. For example, he has a chance to leave it all behind, run off with Mary, who is damn near begging him to do it, but he just can't. Loyalty pulls him in back to his old ways. You'll be riding out for a job with Dutch and he'll say it's wrong, that there's gotta be another way but he goes along with it anyway, back down the black hole of killing and stealing. And when you see people die, it's Arthur that's clearly the most affected, often mourning the losses of his friends, knowing that things could have gone differently, only if he hadn't gone along with the show. When Arthur ultimately learns about his fates and he feels death creeping in, he finally takes action, as if there may be one more good thing he can do before his life comes to an end. It's John. He sees that John has the opportunity to do what he couldn't, to make the changes to his life that he was never able to do, and when John eventually proposes to Abigail with the ring that Arthur gave to Mary, his character arc becomes complete. Tremendous performance, full character transformation, and poignant resolution. He's the perfect character. After the game ends, the epilogue begins and you play as John trying to live out the life that Arthur told him was out there. On one hand, I do appreciate the extra game content, as there's a lot of loose ends that need to be tied off, but the epilogue could have done with being a little bit shorter in my opinion, or just a little bit more linear. I understand the need to wrap things up, especially depicting John as a reformed family man rancher, but the gameplay is pretty dry. A lot of the epilogue is just world building and character building since we meet new faces and explore a new area, which is the perfect opportunity for spicing up the gameplay, or the presentation. But it's back to the same stuff. Fishing trips, herding cows, yelling at Abigail, riding horses in town, and shoveling shit, which isn't the most exciting gameplay. With that said though, Pronghorn Ranch is the best looking area of the game. This place is gorgeous, with vistas of the local mountainside peppered with purple flowers and rolling hills. It just takes your breath away. 
Finally, the game brings you to Breacher's Hope as you buy some land and try to build a house to get Mary back. It's here that you ride out and kill Micah to avenge Arthur, which is where the game finally ends. However, Dutch just doesn't get the proper send off that I think he really deserved. I mean, he just walks off? Like, where does he go? What is he finally realized? Does he have a moment of transformation? A moment of clarity, perhaps? Are they safe from him? Questions that will go unanswered. I like the idea of Dutch finishing Micah off as somewhat of a resolution arc, but we don't get to understand the motives behind it. Although the benefit is that we're left curious. Movies do this all the time, where the movie will suddenly end and cut to black during a moment of climax. For example, in the movie Inception, the totem at the end of the movie, we don't know if it stops spinning or not. So the viewer has to interpret that scene however he or she wants to. So with Red Dead 2, it's another one of those moments for good and bad. Red Dead Redemption 2 is one of the best games I've played in a long time, but it has some extremely obvious downsides. I must have struggled to finish it the first time because it just doesn't move very fast. The controls are bad, it frequently interrupts, tries a little bit too hard with its immersive elements, which end up being quite frustrating for all of its open world glory, but the payoff is worth it. Completing Red Dead 2 is very satisfying, and uh, besides the send off of Dutch, I felt like the ending was quite appropriate. It's like a long novel that takes its sweet time setting up its dense groundworks that go into its amazing story and characters. It belabors the points and the details again and again and again. But by the end of it, everything seems like it has a true purpose, not rushed or streamlined for the accessibility concerns of the masses. Not many games can do what Red Dead Redemption 2 does, which is why there isn't a lot of games like Red Dead Redemption 2. And now that I finished it, I understand what all the fuss is about.